Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're joining us. My name is Ali Hirji. I'm the lead on the Cyber Exchange Advisory Com Committee, and I also work at Durham College, where I work in AI as well as cybersecurity. You know, a couple of days ago, a student of mine told me that uh, the computer that he works on can definitely beat him in chess, but not necessarily in kickboxing. And the idea is, when we think of computers, we think of it in a fashion where we try to imagine how can we humanize computers more and more. About a couple of hours ago, I read this very interesting quote on LinkedIn where the individual mentioned that it's very easy for somebody to write a piece of code that a computer can understand, but write me a piece of code that a human can understand. This very journey of how do we make technology more accessible, more reachable, and more equitable is at the heart of what my work is around at Durham College. Whether it's cybersecurity, privacy, anything to do with that realm, we focus on humanizing it and making it into a practical application for a business. Welcome to the Power Hour, live from the town of Ajax, this beautiful center called the St. Francis Center. We're gathered on the land of the Mississaugas of the Scugog First Nation Island. This land is protected under the Williams Treatises. I'm joined together by two very important individuals from Durham College, both who have not just been colleagues to me, but have been more like mentors. You know, they say, or rather I have often said, you need to know what you do not know. They've helped me on this journey of knowing what I do not know. Chris, Manager of Applied Research at Durham College, welcome to the Power Hour. Thank you very much, Ali. And Debbie, Dean of Applied Research at Durham College, welcome to the Power Hour. Thank you. Chris, I'm going to start off with you and then sort of channel back into what <laughs> applied research means. You've been taking a very specific focus right now on autonomous vehicles. Yep. And we've been discussing this idea of knowing what does it mean to be connected. You and I have exchanged many moments where we said the IoT, mm -hmm. Internet of Things, can very quickly become the Internet of Threats. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what is autonomous vehicles and why is security important to it? Sure, actually. Thanks, Ali. Great, great question. I think uh, really very timely coming on more and more. And so, um, you know, I think when you, when you think about autonomous vehicles, the first thing people think about are fully autonomous. And so uh, maybe pictures or images of cartoons and people flying around in these vehicles come to mind and they, and they think about, well, that's, that's maybe a decade off. And that's probably true. It is. But then you start to think of all the other automation. And, and really, the key thing that makes these vehicles uh, so intriguing will be, in fact, their connectivity to people, to buildings, to uh, other vehicles, to, to everything. And so when you start to think about that connectivity and, and all of the things, uh, you know, as I said, street lights and signs and all of that, um, the, the whole sort of area of vulnerabilities start to become huge. And so, you know, vulnerabilities from maybe two perspectives. One is certainly a cybersecurity point of view where, uh, you know, bad actors could want to maybe um, take control of, of one of these, uh, but also maybe the loss of uh, privacy of, or loss of personal information. Yeah. And so really what, what starts to become really, I think, interesting in all of this is a lot of these things are built on legacy systems legacy components in that. And, and so what I, I think starts to come into the fore on this is this whole notion you're very familiar with is privacy by design, and I think security by design. These yeah. are going to become more and more important in this whole area. So um, hope that, that is yeah. a short answer to your question. I think a couple of days ago, I was talking to Kat Kud about, mm. uh, and you know Kat Kud uh, uh, from, yep. from Binary Tattoo and uh, she sort of is working entirely in the world of privacy, uh, and she made such an important point with regards to privacy by design and security by design, and this is this notion of zero sum versus positive sum. Mm -hmm. Zero sum, referring to the fact that, you know what, uh, we're just going to get whatever information we can at whatever cost. Yep. Positive sum being, we're gonna get information, we're gonna gather information, but understand what's going to happen with all of this information yeah. once we have it. Yes. And this is what draws us into a very important aspect of applied research. And mm. I'll stick with you, Chris, before we transfer mm. over to, to Debbie, is this notion of when people think of autonomous vehicles, they think of cybersecurity, they often get into this mindset which tells them this is a techie space. Yeah, yeah. But from your experience as well, 
you're seeing that whether it's at the Center for Cyber, whether it's at uh, the autonomous vehicle work that we're doing, it's not just technical folks. We're seeing folks with a legal background. Yes. We're seeing folks with a manufacturing background. We're Absolutely. seeing folks with marketing and business backgrounds. Absolutely. What's your perspective on why we're seeing this growth? It's, 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 yeah, that's a, yeah, again, another, another really great question. And, and for sure, there is the tech side of all yeah. of this. But, you know, like in anything that is technology based, you now need users. And when you start to think of all of this, there is now public perception. Sure. Uh, how are people going to see all of these things? And, and how are they going to feel about that sort of stuff? And, and especially in these areas uh, where we're talking about autonomous vehicles, now you've actually got these things potentially running on roadways. Yep. And so now you have policing and all the issues around policing that brings into, I can't even start to imagine how many pieces of legislation will have to be looked at for the impact on that. Um, EMS response for all of that sort of thing. And then that's also going to roll down into economic impact. Uh, I was uh, on a really interesting um, webinar the other day listening about monetizing the curbside and how all of that is going to change. So yeah. that's the business side. So it, it really has a very wide, wide uh, impact on so many different aspects of, uh, of people's lives, not just the technology. So it, it's interesting for sure. You know, I want to play a little bit with that, that yeah. aspect of making impact. Um, you know, often I've told our students this at Durham College that you all have the talent. Mm -hmm. The talent really is there. It's manifest in everything that you do in the classrooms. It's manifest in the work that you do with us in our applied research facilities. But I, I constantly remind them is to have, talent is about that courage. Yep. To, ta to go with your talent where, to the depths of where no people have gone before. Nobody else has gone before. And talk about it. And you know what, if you yeah. fall seven times, you get up the eight times. Uh, absolutely. And there's so many unknowns that we're going into, but we're going into that with a lot of support yep. from a academic standpoint, from a government standpoint, and more importantly, from a community standpoint. Mm -hmm. And this is where I want to draw some attention to applied research. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Debbie, can you explain for our audience, what is applied research and why is it becoming such an important feature of what we do here in Durham Region? Well, thanks for the question, Ali. I, I'm going to start answering that question with what it isn't. Great. Oftentimes when people think about research, they think about someone wearing a lab coat, someone sitting in a laboratory yep. with expensive equipment and you know, making decisions or, or, yep. or making findings that, uh, that will change the world. Th that's what we would call basic research or pure research that is sometimes associated with universities. In the college sector, we do applied research. So applied research, put very simply, is problem solving. It means working with a partner, either a public sector organization, a small medium-sized enterprise, right. or even a public organization, understanding what they need, what their challenges are, and how we can help them. Correct. And the reason why companies or organizations come to us as a college is because we have something that they don't have. We have faculty experts. We have labs and equipment. We have a workforce, which is our students. And so we put all of that together. We put together our expertise of our faculty and our students. We make use of the great resources we have on campus. And we work with that company to do applied research to take what we know and what we can gather and we apply that to help them solve that problem. I think it's very crucial that uh, our audience also realizes the fact that when you're talking about access to a talent pool on campus, you're talking about not just a talent pool, but a talent pool that is guided by faculty and guided by other principal investigators. Um, there's also this notion of supporting from a financial perspective and the partnerships that Durham College has garnered with Ontario Centres for Excellence as an example. Can you help our audience understand a little bit more about if you are a private sector organization, how can you leverage some of the financial benefits of working closely with Durham College? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question, Ali, because that financial piece is a significant one, and it is often a barrier for companies to be able to grow and to innovate, because it, it does cost some money. There is an investment required. And so what we can do at the college is access funds, either through the province or through the federal government, to, to en enable that applied research. So that funding that we can get for companies allows us to cover the costs of releasing faculty from, from yes. teaching uh, and to pay our students. Our students that work on applied research projects 
are paid. Yeah. So these are part-time jobs during the academic year or full-time jobs during the summer where they work exclusively with those uh, clients to help them to solve those problems. I think what better a platform than to sort of personify what you just said, but by talking about the platform that we're on right now. Mm -hmm. So Cyber Exchange, which is a, a byproduct of CyberX, came out of the, the situation with the pandemic, with a lot of in-person sessions uh, being canceled. A lot of our students from Durham College found employment as a result of uh, the Cyber Exchange platform, as a result of this setup here in the town of Ajax. And I think it's very, very crucial to realize the role that we play uh, as college ambassadors in making sure that our students have their best foot forward and, and that potential employers can see that. And during such a challenging time, you know, I'm, I, I would argue that close to about 90% of our students are not only continuing their work in applied research remotely as well, but have found employment as well in some shape or fashion. And I want to pick on this a little bit more, this, this whole idea of creating the right and ripe environment for applied research. And Chris, I'll come to you for a second. And this is this aspect of, you know, I always say this whenever I meet with our industry partners, and that is, look, the facts are many, but the truth is one. And in cybersecurity, the truth is to create test environments can be very challenging. It has to be insulated, it has to be protected, you have to follow a whole number of, uh, of guidelines, et cetera, to create an environment where you can test. How, from an autonomous vehicle standpoint, are we creating environments where testing can happen? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I think you know part of it would depend on what is it that we're going to actually test? Be right. Because we could look at all sorts of different infrastructure type things, but certainly what we could do within the facilities that we have, uh, we could uh, maybe demonstrate or replicate uh, sort of what the connectivity type environment might be for Internet of Things type of applications and sensors. And then we could progressively move out actually into the community, but in more uh, controlled environments. Uh, we see that, I think, with a lot of things around, say, like traffic signals and other yep. things, robots that mm -hmm. where we might actually use them in a park or in a grass cutting operation, not actually on the roadway where they might create risk or things like that. So th I guess to answer your question, it can be a real progression from a very controlled environment we right. have within the facility all the way out into our community, but in a controlled way. Now let's go through this chapter of community a little bit more. You know, I've noticed that, uh, for example, we just did our driving innovation mm -hmm. uh, webinar about a week ago. Yep. And uh, we noticed that, you know, we had close to about 150 to 170 folks, but we noticed how the conversations included everyone. It included yeah. some seniors, it included young kids as well. What is the impact of what we're doing on the community at large, besides just the job creation for students? Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's funny, um, I'm going to answer that maybe two ways. I think the first one really is the impact on our community, I believe anyway, will be in fact what we choose it to be. Uh, you made a really good point earlier, we've got COVID and, and in fact, as we go forward, no one really knows what's going to happen yeah. in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And I think that is a, has a real parallel with autonomous vehicle technology in that, in that uh, I hear from people in communities, especially maybe public works, about what do we need, need to do to get ready? I don't think that's maybe really the right question. I think we need to ask ourselves, what is it that we want to create with this? Because yep. truthfully, no one actually knows. And so I think we have to flip it around and start to think about that. And if we do that, uh, from my perspective, I think a really great way to look at it is to look maybe at the current challenges. So you look at maybe seniors as an example yeah. or other disadvantaged populations. And you might say a real challenge for some of these people might be to get to medical appointments or to get out to visit friends because they don't have mobility solutions. So if we can take those challenges and turn around and throw those to our innovative, our inventor community and say, can you come up? with a solution, can you apply this type of technology to this and see what we can do to help? Then I think what we're doing is we're in fact community building with the technology, which I think is a really different way to look at this. Yeah, you know, the, the common thread, as you know, I've been hosting a, a couple of power hours during my, my lunchtime and it's helped me stay sane, yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially with all of this uh, remote conditioning that we're in. And a common thread uh, amongst many of the cybersecurity experts that we've been speaking to is this idea of it's not about finding yourself, mm. it's about creating yourself. Yeah. And if you're constantly reinventing, you're at home anywhere. Yep. Whether it's you're working remotely, whether yep. it's you're working out of a beautiful studio like this, you're constantly reinventing yourself. And I think over a period of time, at least in the last uh, 18 months or so, Debbie, 
you know, at Durham College, through our students, we've constantly reinvented ideas and always pushed barriers on what is considered normal. We've always been in a new normal almost every semester because of our ways of reinventing. Can we talk a little bit about, quite recently, uh, probably about six to eight months ago, we hosted the Global Cyber Olympics. And that was a moment when we had ethical hackers from around the world come onto campus. What was that feeling like for you? And what did that tell you about the promise and the possibility of cybersecurity training mm -hmm. at Durham College? Well, that was a great experience, uh, hosting Global Cyber Olympics yeah. for the first time, bringing yeah. that event uh, to Canada and to Durham College and yeah. having our faculty and our students take part in that event. You know, I, I find one of the things that we do at Durham College really well is push the limits. Yeah. Um, we're not afraid of taking risks, uh, bringing people together, bringing events on campus that we haven't done before. And I think that's really, really important. I think that it, we, we set a tone for our students and for ourselves that thinking outside of the box is important. Um, one of my colleagues might even say, what box? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, that's an important uh, element for our students to observe. And, and I think it helps them to think about how can I contribute? How can I make a difference? You know, what would happen if I, if I tried something new? And, and we did that. And then I yeah. think we were pretty successful at it. I think our students really enjoyed it. I think the college enjoyed it. I think the competition uh, appreciated uh, being with Durham College. And I, th I think it just says something about, um, about our, our culture and, and, yeah. and what makes us tick. How do you think from your perspective, like in, in the world of applied research, as you mentioned, you know, we're in competitions, we're creating prototypes. How does our work in applied research relate to our academic training as well? Uh, how, do, how do we feed in students from our academic base? Can you shed some light on that? Oh, what a great question, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, at Durham College, the programs that we offer uh, are uh, uh, up to date, they offer students an opportunity to learn the cutting edge skills, technologies that are required in the workplace. And so when students graduate, they are learning the top notch skills that they need to be successful in the workplace. By engaging in applied research, they're able to take those skills that they learn in the classroom and apply them mm. in a real world setting with a real company, with real challenges, with real bosses. And so learning how to interact with colleagues, with supervisors, uh, with clients is an incredibly important skill for our students to learn. So it's, it's refining those technical skills while they're also developing those critical skills or essential employability skills or soft skills so that when they graduate, they've got the whole package. They've got the technical skills and they've got the, the soft skills and they know what it takes to be successful in the, in the work. They've got a good reference. They've got experience. They've got a, a good solid resume that they can present to future employers. Let's, let's zoom, narrow in a little bit on that word success. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about, and you know, we'll come back a little bit to the autonomous vehicle file, mm -hmm. which is really hot <laughs> in our <laughs> perimeters at this point. Um, but one of the things when I when we launched the Center for Cybersecurity Innovation, uh, and then three weeks later, that was in BC before Corona, and then three weeks later we had to shut down. But even though we are just three weeks old, we were at the Women in Cybersecurity Conference, and folks were talking to me about why the center is important, and they raised this issue around entrepreneurship at Durham mm -hmm. College. Mm -hmm. And you know, about a couple of days ago, I was speaking to Shelley Walk Martin from the Sands Institute, uh, well known to President Don Lavisa as well, and I, I made a comment to her in which I said, look, you know, you have to give cybersecurity professionals or people interested in cybersecurity the ability to dream. Because if they don't pursue their own dreams, somebody's going to hire them to build their own dreams, mm -hmm. right? And we've really focused on that at Durham College, which is if you have a particular skill set, whether it's technical or non-technical, you can get into applied research. It's competitive. Let's not make any, uh, draw any curtains around that but you can also go down the entrepreneurial route. Mm -hmm. What are some of the resources around entrepreneurship that are available to students? So at Durham College, we have a program called Fast Start yeah. DC, and Fast Start is there to serve students from any program who are interested in exploring entrepreneurship. Those are students who could have already started a business. Yep. It could be students who just think that entrepreneurship might be of interest right. to them. So at any stage in, in from ideation to perhaps even running a business, uh, the Fast Start team is able to support students to help them to understand who their clients are, um, how to market their program, how to create an, uh, a Shopify account, uh, 
all the aspects of, of becoming an entrepreneur, um, the ups and the downs are something that the Fast Start team can support them with. Even mm -hmm. the legal aspects yep. around payroll and contracts and, and all of those, those risk mitigation pieces that an entrepreneur needs to know. And sometimes students who go through our entrepreneurship uh, services or even our entrepreneurship program, um, take those skills that they've learned and they uh, become an entrepreneur, or in other yeah. words, mm -hmm. uh, an employee in a corporate setting who has an entrepreneurial spirit. And that's just as important to our, our workforce as, as entrepreneurs are. It's, it's yeah, a it great is. program. It is. And can I add to that? Absolutely. If you don't mind, I just, because it was a recent example I had that I think, um, and, and you and me, I'll, I'll start with a beer example, because I, I like that area. But, but it, I think- Don't we all, Chris? <laughs> I think what it does is it, in fact, actually applies to all of our applied research projects. And just recently, it was really uh, heartwarming to get a, a very uh, one after the other uh, message from two of our mm -hmm. students who had worked in our Center for Craft Brewing Innovation. They had both actually landed jobs with leading edge companies in that area. And I thought that was so great because, you know, when I looked at what we did in that particular instance, we, yes, we were doing lab testing and yes, they uh, got to use the uh, latest and greatest technology and things like that. But we put them in an environment where they had customers that they had to deal with. And we dealt with all the real things around what do you need to do to actually serve a customer. And so to Debbie's point, it was, I think, a great environment for them to learn both the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills so to me, what I really see the, the power of applied research projects is it really gives students that opportunity to move from kind of a classroom environment more towards that workplace environment. It's, it's a bit of that transition. And, you know, uh, when you talk to students frequently about getting jobs, they complain about or bemoan uh, the chicken and the rag. You know, you, you go out to industry and you're yeah. looking for work and they say, well, I need someone with experience. And they say, well, if you don't hire me, how do I get experience? And I think applied research projects are really a great uh, not the only, but, but provide a really great opportunity to address that and, and get our students that experience so they become very valuable employees. You know, Satya Nadella from Microsoft says, you know, in, in two months, we've experienced two years worth of transformation. Yes. In your opinion, how are you keeping pace now with the rate of transformation? Wow, yeah, a, g a really interesting question. Uh, probably initially it was subscribing to every webinar I could <laughs> lay my hands on and uh, just uh, really sort of uh, soaking in the information and that and really paying attention to, I think, uh, thought leaders out there in terms of what they were saying about this sort of stuff. Uh, more and more I found that it sort of helped me form uh, a strategic view on what's forward. probably okay. happening going forward. And so uh, now starting to get a bit more, um, I guess, picky on, on in terms of what I'm actually paying attention to or maybe, uh, maybe clearer on the sort of information that I'm looking for now. But uh, I think the other thing is um, really adopting a very experimental view to what I do is, is we don't know what's going to happen in the next 30, 60, 90 days. And so a lot of this is just testing and testing and testing, but the cadence has picked up. It's, it's like not a week or a month, it's like every day thinking yeah. about what am I going to try today and how is this going to work and what can I adjust for tomorrow or the next few days. And I think to some extent it's also this, this competition of staying relevant, mm. right? And uh, while a lot of folks have just been uh, waiting to yeah. see what happens and waiting yeah. for things to come back mm. to normal, I think, uh, you know, to quote Thomas Friedman, there's no going back home, nope. right? Everything has changed and, uh, you know, that's, it's the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. Speaking of that reality, Debbie, I, you know, and this competitive ethos, you know, we've held a couple of sessions with privacy experts. And um, one of the statements that was made was that, look, privacy is not about the fact that I have something to hide. It's that I have something to protect. Mm -hmm. If companies are to come to Durham College to do work in both cybersecurity and autonomous vehicles, how do you manage the intellectual property? Mm -hmm. A great question. And, and I think uh, intellectual property is... Yeah. is increasingly important to our clients and our entrepreneurs sure. that we're working with uh, as 
technologies are being developed so quickly and, and as you've said that the environment is, is so competitive. Yeah. So our, our approach to intellectual property at Durham College is that the client retains full ownership of intellectual property. Um, our interest is not in taking a, an equity stake in companies or looking for, for royalties of products. That's not our business. That, that's not why we engage in applied research. So companies that work with us can rest assured that their IP that they've, they've shared with us that we can help them to develop uh, will remain their IP. What we, it, some people then may ask, well, then why do you engage in applied research? Why does it matter? It really goes back to that student experience yep. that you've talked about and supporting community economic development. Those really are our two drivers. We as a, a member of the community, we're here to support our, our economic development, sure. our mm -hmm. local businesses, and to see our students have as many rich and uh, important opportunities as they can. That's why we're, why, that's why we're here. Fantastic. Chris, I'll come to you with some closing comments on this file of autonomous vehicles. Mm. Um, starting at the CISO Forum in 2019 out in Niagara Falls, um, you had held a session with, uh, with a couple of folks just looking at the integrations of 5G and autonomous vehicles. Uh, quite recently, you've started going into topics around security and privacy, but you've also started going into the aspects of the legalities and mm -hmm. frameworks for autonomous vehicle development. If someone has an interest in developing a framework on how they should be creating a particular chip that would be used in a smart mobility device or something to that effect, is that something that you would also entertain or does it just have to be something technical, something deployable? Yeah, no, I, I think really uh, anything that would be a, a sort of a technical type solution uh, to one of these challenges that society is going to face. We would love to actually talk with them about that, see if we can uh, link them up with faculty who have expertise, put a project together with students, see if we can get them funding for that. It's very, very broad. As you mentioned, um, I had a discussion actually with some of our faculty in the School of Justice and Emergency Services. Yep. And I, I didn't know this, but we have a course there that uh, deals with the Highway Traffic Act. And so currently we're working with uh, an organization on trying to develop a protocol that would help communities uh, really rate roadways as to the suitability of driving at different levels of uh, of autonomous vehicle driving. And I was talking to them about, you know, wow, that would be a really interesting sort of a placement or uh, some sort of a project for students to help us actually tease out what are the aspects or areas of the Highway Traffic Act currently that will be impacted by an activity like that and what will we have to consider? So again, a very broad, broad base uh, uh, in this whole area. It's, it's, the more I get in, in it, the more I realize there's just more to do. And Debbie, I think as, as, as Chris brought up, the more we get into it, the more we realize there's we can do and the more we realize that there's more people that mm -hmm. we can work with. If I'm not mistaken, in the recent past, we've also had different partnerships with the city of Oshawa, the town of Ajax, town of Whitby. Let's pick on one, for example, like with city of Oshawa teaching city. Mm -hmm. how, did the, how do these things come about and uh, how is it being supported through applied research? Mm -hmm. Uh, so City of Oshawa, uh, they're really a leader in uh, collaborations with uh, post-secondary institutions. Yep. So they created the Teaching City a couple of years ago, which was intended to work with uh, Durham College, uh, Ontario Tech, Trent University, yep. and also uh, the Civil Engineering Department at uh, University of Toronto to allow those institutions to work with the city on problems that are of, of significance to the city. So the city will do a call out uh, with particular problems that the city has that they would like to have some student input on. And so the, the, the uh, institutions have an opportunity to uh, submit proposals that will address right. those city problems. And together with uh, the guidance of city staff, a, a college or a university team can, yeah, can work that, yeah. with, with staff to address that problem. It's been in incredibly uh, rich. Uh, right for our students to be able to understand the municipal needs. Yeah. It's great projects. And I think it's crucial also for our audience to appreciate how applied research actually shapes the community in different ways. Um, about two years ago, I think late 2018, mm -hmm. uh, we had the announcement of GM shutting down and with 2019 it's shutting down. But as a result of applied research, we've been able to create opportunities and reshape how a particular, our, our community mm -hmm. gets seen as almost a tech hub for the East. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, Chris, where do you see this applied research heading to 
for the next few years? Where do you see some of the, the wow. hot areas of growth? <laughs> That's a real blue sky question. Uh, yeah. I think just sort of to uh, piggyback on what Debbie said, that, that we have communities uh, that are supporting us, that are leaders in, in trying to move forward with, with what their communities and create uh, great communities. And I would see that uh, applied research would just become more and more involved in supporting those efforts, as you said, with, with not only the technology, but with uh, a whole broad base yep. sort of opportunities and solutions, both for students and certainly our community partners. And Debbie, I'll give the closing comments to you. You know, they say that the secrets to success are that there are no secrets. How have you managed to keep your applied research team well-oiled, well-prepared during this challenging time? What a great question. Um, I, I think a lot of it is about transparency and open communication and supporting one another. I think that's been absolutely crucial. We've spent a lot of time together uh, on, on Zoom calls and yeah. other technologies mm -hmm. calls, and, yeah. and uh, just checking in when, with one another. Uh, how are we doing? Mm -hmm. And I think that's been really important to keep those lines of communication open. One of the things that I really miss is, is seeing my colleagues yeah. in person. Yes. And, uh, and, and that's, that's really important to, to, to be honest and um, and, and just be there for one another. I think that's, that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect concluding remark on which I'd like to bring this power hour to a close. When you think about it, you know, we've mentioned at least umpteen number of times the role of people, the importance of personalities, the importance of humanizing these exchanges. What's even more important to realize is that as more and more people believe in computers, the Durham College position has been believe in yourself first. And this is what has realized all of the various centers at Durham College, especially the Center for Cybersecurity Innovation. Being a part of it has made me not only more humbled to knowing what I do not know, but seeing the fact that within a couple of months, our students have put together at least six different projects and are now also a part of this cyber exchange and are employed by different companies tells me that believing in ourselves is a very good starting point in order to achieve more and more innovation. I look forward to hosting you at another Power Hour session, and I thank Chris and Debbie for taking out the time, the beautiful St. Francis Ajax Center, and I look forward to hosting you in further sessions in the future. Thank you very much, Chris Perfect. and Debbie. Perfect, and thank, thank you, you, Ali. Thank you.